I'm really lucky in that I've had a wonderful career in nursing. I've been a nurse for 35 years now and I've worked in lots of really interesting specialty areas. But um, one of the very first areas I worked in was um, haematology oncology and I seem to have come full circle back to that point and I'm now working in an oncology unit where we treat um, hematology, haematological disorders as well as, um, as hemochromatosis patients. A venesection is the name we give to the, the process we do to, to take some blood from someone, which is the current best treatment for hemochromatosis. So it literally means um, cutting into a vein um, and we just pop a needle into a vein and we drain off some blood to reduce their iron stores. A person with hemochromatosis absorbs more iron than they need to and the body has no way of excreting iron and so it builds up and it gets stored in their organs where it can cause damage. So we want to take some of that iron back out of the organs and get rid of it. A lot of our iron is stored in the form of haemoglobin and when we take someone's blood we, we get rid of some of that haemoglobin. When the body tries to rebuild what we've taken away they take some of the iron out of the organs therefore lessening that that deposit in those places. It's quite daunting for people because often they haven't heard of hemochromatosis. So they've got suddenly got this, they've been diagnosed with a disorder that they've never heard anybody else talk about. Um, so there's a whole lot of knowledge that needs to be attained. It's really important to sit down and have a really good chat with someone and explain to them what it is that it's a genetic disorder and that this treatment um, is ongoing. It's an ongoing treatment that you have for life, but it, it is a really simple and has a really effective result, the treatment. It's exactly the same process and in fact we like lots of people who can to give their blood donations at the Red Cross because their blood from um, people with hemochromatosis can often be used to actually help other people. So not only are you helping your own disorder but you're helping somebody else as well. There are situations where the Red Cross for various reasons aren't able to use the blood of someone with hemochromatosis but on the whole um, they can and often people with hemochromatosis actually need venous sections more frequently so they're actually a terrific um, donor source for the Red Cross. Their doctor will fill in an app on the, on the computer so there's no longer any paper forms. Their doctor will sit down and with their provider number they can actually enter that um, that app and give the details and a, a venous section schedule will be generated and then they can attend the, the Red Cross. So some people are trickier than others to actually to perform a venous section on and that's when they'll often go to a hospital or a GP clinic. Um, for things like poor access, some people have lovely big juicy veins that jump out at you and are very easy to access, other people don't. And so one of the reasons they might come to a hospital is because of the poor access to those ve veins. The Red Cross blood service is terrific because they have good extended hours and some patients struggle with getting time off work to be able to, um, to get their vena sections performed. Um, so the Red Cross is great from that aspect. If that's not a, a resource that you can use, um, some GP clinics um, perform vena sections and various hospital outpatient clinics also perform vena sections and there are some pathology services who um, also have that service. It's really important to have a good breakfast the day you're having a venous section and be drinking well and be well hydrated. So we always encourage our patients to have a hearty breakfast, have some good snacks with them to eat, drink well, several glasses of fluid that morning, preferably even the day before to just make sure they're well hydrated. Keeping warm is good if it's the winter um, and we'll often put a hot pack onto an arm when we prepare the patient when they arrive in the clinic to just warm up those veins. Some physical exercise is really good if they go for a brisk walk or up and down a couple of flights of stairs that also helps to um, make that access easier for us nurses. Some people ride through a venous section with no side effects whatsoever. They come in, they have their blood taken, they leave again and there's no issue whatsoever. Other people can struggle a bit. People can come in and they don't cope very well with the change in the amount of fluid in their blood and they can be inclined to feel a bit woozy and faint. So that's important to watch out for. 
Nobody likes to have needles and many people don't like the sight of blood as well. So it's really important from a nursing perspective to make people feel comfortable and relaxed and shield them from whatever they don't need to, you know, whatever they can't cope with. So sometimes we might just help have someone chatting on the other side of them, talking to them so they're distracted from what we're doing on the side we're working with and they don't have to look at the, um, look at what's happening. Drop the blood bag out of view where um, they just can't see it draining away often helps for people. And um, often that just that distraction and something different to be focused on really helps them to get through. After a venous section, there are a few things we like to keep an eye out for. It can develop a hematoma at the site and also phlebitis from infection that might be um, inadvertently happening at the site. Um, the patients can also may feel tired or a bit weary for, for 24 hours or so, some people. There is a possibility of, of bleeding after the, after the infusion. We tend to always put a bandage around the arm, but also tell the patients to just be aware and keep an eye on that site, looking for bleeding, looking for infection. Long term, you can get some scarring, so it's a really good idea to use um, alternate arms, each venous section, just to go from one side to the other. And um, it's also really important to be monitoring the patient through these venous sections. So we're looking for what their haemoglobin is and what their serum ferritin is doing. It is possible to actually bleed someone so much you actually make them anemic and we're certainly trying to avoid that. So it's really important to be watching the haemoglobin and you wouldn't tend to go ahead with a venous section unless um, your haemoglobin is greater than 120 grams per litre. Monitoring the serum ferritin is also really important to tell you whether it's safe to continue taking more iron out of someone. So we monitor that. Um, probably every six to four to six weeks, or four to six venous sections, sorry, uh, initially. But as the serum ferritin comes down and gets closer to the goals that we're aiming for, you would monitor more regularly just to make sure it's actually safe to remove more iron. There are, and something I always like to do with someone who's new to hemochromatosis is to really sit down and um, spend some time with them, helping answer their questions, but also helping them understand the process that we need to go through and how important it is that their family members are made aware of this so we can track down other cases, seeing this is actually passed on genetically. Over the last 10 or so, five to 10 years, there's been huge advances in what we know about hemochromatosis and how we diagnose it and look at it and treat these patients. So in years gone by, there were patients who were diagnosed or told that they had hemochromatosis. They started to come along for venous sections and, um, and then they've just been keeping coming for the last eight or 10 years. Now, some of these patients, were misdiagnosed just because we didn't know then what we know about what we know now. So um, I went through a process of actually going through every single one of my patients in Wangaratta and looking up their gene studies. And interestingly, a third of those patients did not have hemochromatosis. So I went through this undiagnosing phase. So what that brings us to is it's actually really important when we start out and we have a new patient coming in that we know that they have got hemochromatosis and they are actually um, suitable candidates to need venesecting. They did not have hereditary hemochromatosis. They often had a raised ferritin, but it was for a different reason. And for different reasons, you wouldn't actually perform a venous section. There's quite strict criteria for who receives a venous section. And if someone's ferritin is raised for another reason, it's really important to find what that reason is and treat that appropriately. Sometimes if it's really, really difficult to access a vein, we'd normally go in the cubital fossa, but sometimes people just don't have any veins there that are accessible. So what we do, and I've known other people to do in other clinics, is to actually cannulate the patient. And you can get away with a needle as small as a 22 gauge um, cannulation needle. Pop that in and then connect it to a three-way tap and a 10 mil syringe, which then the three-way tap then connects onto the venous section bag. And you can very slowly and methodically just sit there and draw blood out um, encourage it with the syringe if it gets a bit sluggish and just let it very, very slowly flow into the venous section bag and you can successfully take um, a unit of blood from someone with that method. Occasionally we've used an ultrasound to locate a suitable vein too, somewhere in the upper arm. 
So initially when people are diagnosed, they can come in with quite high ferritin levels and it's really important to bring those levels down reasonably, you know, reasonably timely fashion if we can. So we like to venesect every week and that seems like a lot, um, but it's, it's the ideal is to be bringing it down in a timely way. Sometimes these people can need venesections for 12, 18 months, two years to bring their ferritin back down to an acceptable level and that's a long time to be having weekly venesections. So they can sometimes struggle to, um, to keep reproducing that blood you're taking away. We want to be doing that because we want to be using up that iron that's stored in your liver or various other places. But the body needs other things to create that haemoglobin as well. And sometimes a little bit of extra um, vitamin B12 or folate can help that process of rebuilding those, that haemoglobin and those red blood cells. Um, that needs to be, cro needs to be um, passed by a doctor. Um, nurses shouldn't be ordering these sort of things. But it might be a nurse's role to suggest to a doctor, could we give this patient some B12 and some folate just to help that process along and help them maintain those weekly venesections. If they can't keep their haemoglobin above, usually we say about 120, um, then you have to delay a venesection, give them a week's rest. And that just prolongs that process of, um, of deioning, we call it deioning. I think one of the really um, ways to really give the patients the best possible care comes from working as a team of three. It's the nurses working with the doctors and with the patients. We all have a really important role and the best outcome for these hemochromatosis patients is where all three of those units work together effectively. So it's really important to keep the communication up between those areas, to share knowledge, um, to work together uh, for the best outcomes for the patient. We're moving, really moving forward in that area and it's terrific to see more and more GPs and nurses starting to know about hemochromatosis and to be looking for that um, when they're doing other tests and things. When someone presents with some various signs and symptoms, the doctors are starting to um, be more aware and the recognition is increasing, which is exactly what we want. A great resource for hemochromatosis for the patients particularly is the Hemochromatosis Australia website. They have links, they have an information hotline, they can call and talk to someone with hemochromatosis and uh, health professionals can also use access that information and use that resource. Many of the primary health networks are now incorporating a hemochromatosis um, section on there with GPs and health professionals can access information and gives them a structured way to, um, to treat these disorders. There's a couple of terrific modules online that you can do and both of them can be accessed through the Hemochromatosis Australia website. One is a nurses learning module through the Australian Primary Healthcare Nurses Association and one through um, Acrum for Doctors.